I really welcome this opportunity and I'm very grateful to the organizer because I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to make a fool of myself and, and talk about things that I do not know. Uh, research, uh, contrary to what we write in our um, grants. We all write grants in which, of course, we sell yesterday project in order to do tomorrow project. Uh, shouldn't say this why we are on record, but uh, <laughs> that's not true, of course, not, not in my case, but my colleagues, that's what they do. Uh, uh, but, um, but it is true that research is, uh, is a matter of uh, stepping into things you do not know, and that's why it's called research, and no, I don't know what kind of results I'm going to get, sorry, Research Council. Um, but no, can't do that with a grant, but you can do that with colleagues uh, at a talk. So what I'm going to speak about today are things that I'm still working on which is also called for the less nice people in the room. Don't shoot. <laughs> if I'm wrong, well, it happens. And uh, if I'm confused and I need some help, uh, well, uh, well uh, the, the help is welcome, uh, as opposed to uh, nasty criticism. Um, the topic is, uh, as you can uh, tell, and it's probably so from the abstract, uh, uncertainty. Uh, if you follow ideas uh, in a sort of logical order, they, they do lead you to corners that you unexpectedly didn't mean to reach, but no, that's where the logic goes, and uh, uh, if you listen carefully, uh, that's where the logic leads. So I did not mean to work on uncertainty until recently, but as I hope to be able to explain in this uh, talk, uh, that's where some of the uh, pieces on the chessboard are leading to, and therefore, uh, surprisingly, as this for myself, I'm back to a topic which is a classic in philosophy. Uh, of course, uncertainty since uh, the old Greeks uh, and skepticism all the way through Descartes and Wittgenstein, who wrote, as you all know, uh, never publish, uh, uh, a book called On Certainty. Um, it's, a, it's a classic in our field. And if anyone had told me a few years ago that in order to write a chapter in my next book, which is called The Politics of Information, I would have been sort of uh, trying to explore the value of uncertainty, I would say, oh, certainly not. Well, how can you possibly imagine that? I'm going to put my bishop in that corner on the chessboard. And then, no, oh, no, several moves later, that's exactly where the bishop has to be. Uh, and uh, that's the logic uh, that I'm going to follow. So this is by way of a uh, quick introduction. Um, one more uh, point before I start. Uh, there will be plenty of slides, as you may imagine. I'm going to stay right in the middle, so I hope that you can see it left and right. Um, there's a trick that I'm going to play, uh, that's for the youngest among us, uh, which is I'm going to try to start uh, in, in a very simple way. Uh, so people start relaxing and then you hit them very hard. As soon as like, oh, boom! <laughs> so what happened? So, <laughs> that's a classic trick in philosophy. And uh, so you start with something obvious, like 2 plus 2 is equal 4, and then next thing you know there are three volumes of Principia Mathematica proving that. So, uh, like, we thought that two, everybody agreed. Or so. Yeah, so, so don't fall for the trick, but no, once you learn that trick, it's very hard to give it up. So I, I shall play it, but I want you to be a little bit warned about the constructive way in which uh, the talk will progress. And speaking of which, the first, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a framework. Uh, as the, they say in the philosophy part, you don't have to agree with me, but it's good to know where you disagree if you disagree. So this is a matter of being on the same page. And in order to reach in about 45 minutes, where's Gianluca? Yeah, so, um, you will wave something and say, oh, too late. Uh, there is a clock here. Um, in order to uh, reach the point of why uncertainty is valuable today, um, I will need to accumulate a lot of uh, framework and uh, background. The first w one will be what happens to politics in, in uh, uh, a context where we can start talking about hyperhistory. All that will be explained uh, in a little while. Once we have that, uh, I will step forward and then you know, we have a, a particular historical context, what it means to do politics in that context, and what it means to have uh, agents that do politics in that context. So you have the context, you have the politics in that context, the agents, you can see the trick being played here. You, know, so you start layering uh, up. And uh, how, how about understanding agents as bundles of norms? Uh, it takes a whole metaphysics to understand things as roundabouts, and we won't do that here today, but it's perfectly possible. In fact, that's where some of the philosophy of science 
the best of it uh, tends to push us. You, I'll say this now, we can come back to this. There are no things, just in case you thought there were. There are no objects, things as in things. We can discuss this later, but there are only relations and processes. Um, and, and from that perspective, there are no agents. There are only bundles of uh, properties, processes. Think of uh, a, u a new unit in the department being created out of nowhere. Uh, you just decided some uh, uh, processing power is going to be uh, unified around that particular uh, new organization. Once we have that, and that's also all by way of uh, background, if we live in a new, t a new time, hyperhistory, and we need to do politics in that new time, and politics is done by agents, and agents are understood as bundles of norms, we'll get there, it's just uh, uh, showing you the menu. What are the principles according to which we design the agents as bundles of norms that are good enough to do the right politics at this time? So you can go back and forward. New time, politics, agents, design of the agents, what principles, or what principles, etc. So the principles that I'm going to discuss are justice and tolerance, as historically being the two principles that have sort of informed the design of macroscopic agents, until recently national states, that can do a good job in terms of politics at the time when you're talking. Once we have that, I will finally introduce uncertainty. What uncertainty has got to do with all this designing the multi-agent systems that govern uh, politics in hyperhistory. And uh, I will try to show you that today uh, power is, as in socio-political power, as in control or shape of uh, people's behaviour, it's be better understood as not control of the means of production, good old days when production of things meant something, not as control of the means of production of information about things, but as controls of the means of production or management of the questions leading to the information, leading to the control of things. So things, information about things, questions generating the information about things. You step backward and you can start seeing why uh, I was asked by Google to join the right to be forgotten. Who has power today are those who are can actually shape the questions. Those who can shape the questions determine the answers, and those who determine the answers control reality. That's going to be the end of the talk. Now, with that conclusion, uh, as you were in the background, um, let's have something in terms of understanding where we are, the framework. So suppose that Bob and, and Alice, uh, oh, Bob and Alice, uh, Alice is because uh, you may have you know, 150 years since Alice in Wonderland, but actually uh, Alice, Bob and uh, Carol are the three agents in any philosophy of quantum physics. And if you are in Oxford, you do a lot of philosophy on quantum physics, by the end of the day, you always speak about Alice, Bob and Carol as the three agents. So the three agents, in our case only two, Bob and Alice um, are in this particular predicament. Uh, Bob is violently forced to move outside is somewhere and someone is really kicking his ass to move out. Oh, that's too bad. That's violence. That's intolerance. And Alice, she's outside. But someone is kicking her ass and really wants her inside. That's also intolerance. I hope you agree with me. I hope that this is not nice. Think for a moment. Alice and Bob, one inside, the other inside. They're being moved forcefully, violently in the other direction. Now, that moving, the violence forcing, is called in Greek uh, anankazoi. Uh, it really means at a gun point. They didn't have guns at their time, but basically that's the idea. It really means kicking someone in the butt to make sure that violently you force the hand of that person. You, is screaming, kicking, you make them do what you want. So if you are with me, and you probably dislike this uh, idea of exercise, exercising an, uh, an anke on anyone, this is the tradition in which we live. This is Plato, and it's the Republic, and someone was nicely sleeping in the cave uh, and didn't want to be disturbed, but that's the philosopher for you. Compelled to stand up suddenly and turn his head around and walk and to lift up his eyes to the light, and in doing all this felt pain. Remember, he was inside didn't want to get outside. And the word used is anankazoito, exactly what the philosopher is doing to that poor guy, forced to live. That's intolerance. We may think, oh, that, but they, they know better. The philosopher knows. 
yeah, well, well maybe he knows, but that's paternalism. You have to have other means to convince that person to leave the cave. And that's the other leg of our tradition, is either Plato or the Bible, one, one or the two, and then, then we have Western civilization. Uh, surprisingly, it's the same word. Oops. And as is, the master told his servant, go out to the road, and uh, that guy was outside, get it inside. Compel and uncousin them to come in so that my house will be full. So it's the same idea in Greek of forcing someone to move out or come in, and it's Plato, and uh, of course, speaking for Socrates, and it's Luke, speaking for someone else. Uh, that's the tradition in which we live. We think that in both cases they are justified, and they, they know what they're doing. In one case, it's, it's a great philosophy, in the other case, it might even be God, so surely uh, someone must know what he's doing here. Um, but this is the intolerant tradition in which we have grew up, and we just assume that these are the good guys, so yeah, you know, we, we allow them to be a little bit forceful in convincing other people to do what they want to do. Now, would, we need to keep this in mind, you know, tolerance will come back, hold that ball up in the air, and let's switch page. Fast forward about 25 centuries or so, and uh, that's the picture we have uh, to simplify. Prehistory in a history book, not, not by me, but by a history textbook, is described as any stage in human development, so it could, it's not a, a, a time concept, it's an adverb, as it were. You live prehistorically if you live in a, uh, in a context where, I'm sure you know just to remind you, if you live in a society which does not have the means to uh, record the present for future consumption. In other words, it's an oral culture. And if it is an oral culture, it means that you can have only that much of transmission from present to future. So that's prehistory. And now a couple of villages probably still in the Amazonian <coughs> environment that are prehistoric. We move from prehistory, and that happened roughly 6,000 years ago, to history once we have means of recording and therefore transmitting from one generation to any future generation ideally, allegedly. Uh, and that's when uh, we move from no ICTs, no information communication technologies, which for us means normally writing, but it could have been something else, painting, to a uh, world in which we all live historically, meaning that individual and social well-being um, starts being connected with ICT. There is no Roman Empire without writing, there is no British Empire without writing. I mean, that's the end of the story. You need to be able to transmit information and organize, and all that requires you know, writing of some sort, coding, etc. We recently moved into a more sort of, uh, interesting stage, uh, which I have uh, labeled hyperhistory, but you don't have to like the label to understand the concept, when basically ICTs become not just a matter of being no, individual and, and social well-being being connected to it, but actually dependent upon. It's one thing to say, well, there's no Roman Empire without uh, writing, and another thing to say that uh, we live in a hyperhistorical society which could be put on its knees by a cyber attack. A cyber attack means simply that those who live by the digit, they die by the digit, just to be you know, Bible-oriented. So uh, it means that the society is so heavily dependent on ICT that that is where you can really hurt that society. Now, this shift from no ICT to connected to ICT to depended upon, as in heavily hanging on that stuff, that has meant that we have, uh, or we are actually currently witnessing, and it will take ages uh, before all this is digested and transformed. We're looking at um, a trans many transformations and conceptually in terms of organization and so on, but one of them uh, affects the nature of the state. I'll tell you more in a moment. But basically, we have often understood. We used, and I'm oversimplifying, I know that you know better, so forgive me for this. But we used to think about the state as the information agent. We've been using that idea, at least implicitly, for the no, past few hundred years. Um, it is the information agent because it, in theory, more or less gently or invasively, controls education, census, taxes, police records, legislation, press, intelligence. So when we are told, how about uh, phone records? Well, that's just more of the same story. I mean, just the state doing what the state does, control information. Uh, I remind other people, uh, when they're not here, that the first uh, B in BBC is British. It's 
British for a reason. I mean, it's a, that's, that's you know, it's what we have uh, as, a, as a tradition. And it doesn't have to be a nasty stuff. It's just what we like sometimes or uh, accept as a way of organizing ourselves. So in a hyper-historical context where essentially society becomes entirely dependent upon for its well-being on ICTs, what happens to the major agents that are producing, controlling, managing information uh, flows in that society. As I said, I'll tell you more in a moment, uh, but the idea uh, behind it is that the state is no longer the only or main information agent. There are many others. Uh, you just have to look at the Greek crisis to understand how many other agents are in question. Good old days, that would have been solved by sending a few tanks from another country nearby. Uh, these days, well, there's the um, International Monetary Fund. Like, who are they? I mean, just new guys? Uh, what's the flag? Uh, so there's a lot going on, more than just the, you know, state versus state. Um, what we are witnessing basically is kind of the coming to an end of the, uh, of the Westphalian system. And I know that you've seen this many times, so I'm just reminding you. But what we don't have, and I'm sure you can read this, we don't quite have an, a post-Westphalian order. The Westphalian order has served us very well for a few hundred years. Um, and for those of you who have forgotten, that's the, the, the difference between the three musketeers and 20 years later. By the time they meet again, the Westphalian uh, peace has happened. No? Remember when the three musketeers, at least as a kid, why Richelieu is wearing an armor uh, as a kid? Like, he's a, he's a, he's a cardinal. I was from Rome, and the cardinals you know, by then didn't wear, so uh, <laughs> didn't have weapons. And that's just because uh, no, we, no, it was World War Zero. Uh, they were killing each other by the buckets uh, here in Europe, uh, and for religious reasons. Uh, by the time the Three Musketeers meet again, uh, the Westphalian peace has happened, and the Westphalian system has uh, taken roots. But what do we do with this post-Westphalian uh, context, where basically there are plenty of non-state organizations, NGOs, big corporate, Google, uh, or any UN uh, agency you can think of, and so on? that are uh, also uh, operating at their level. The quick uh, description, and I hope this is sufficiently big. Uh, yeah. um, so good old days, so we had nation states, and I'm oversimplifying, uh, but as, as usual with, with the pizza, it's the real test is to make a margarita. Anyone can add toppings. So don't tell me that you won't add toppings, I know. Uh, but no, the toppings can come later we need to check whether the margarita is good enough. So the margarita here is that nation states are aware that they're information agent. Uh, they relied on information technologies to grow and become what they are. But information uh, societies uh, become global and basically the very tools or the very information uh, technologies that empowered and created the states are also empowering creating other uh, agents inevitably. So global challenges uh, start requiring big political agents. Think of the environment, for example. It's not just up to France or Japan or Ireland or to solve it. And we just thought, that's good old days. We just need to keep all the states together. Uh, no, Richelieu kind of uh, solution. Uh, big problems, big agents, the agents around other states. Westphalian system, talk to the states, we'll find a solution. But meanwhile, as I said, uh, information societies empower other information multi-agent systems. And these ones are also becoming the new political agents involved uh, in those spe specific uh, problems. So within that context, um, states become information societies which empower a variety of new multi-agent systems, which transform uh, centralized government into distributed governance. But this is all, I hope, a big reminder. So there's no end of history for those of you who actually read the book, uh, but more of a hyper history. If anything, we are relying more on our information technologies than ever before. Modern politics is based on sovereign states, Westphalian system, and even universal human rights, but these are becoming insufficient. Not wrong, not unnecessary, but insufficient to solve the problems that we have at hand. The political problem therefore becomes, how can we design the multi-agent systems including sovereign states themselves, which are becoming more like multi-agent systems, that can match the challenges that we are facing now. It's basically an upgrade, or Westphalian 2.0, as you were. Uh, how do we move there? And how do we move there, above all, without having a World War Zero or World War I or two? That's normally the way history moves. A major, major fucked up that, no, it will be of historical proportions. And then finally we say, oh, we should really do something about this. 
the trouble is that in the past, no matter how terrible the past has been, you know, World War II, the Holocaust, and everything, we had time. The economic reasoning that you know, in the long run things will be fixed, say, by the market or by the other forces, had that close in the long run as a reliable close. Today, some of the challenges we're facing, financial, uh, environmental, social, uh, religious, and so on, may not come with a sufficient time to be solved. So that's the difference with the past. If, say, we make a real mess of the environment, it might be no longer possible to reverse that mess. If the Gulf flow stops coming here, there is no re-engineering of that. Um, just in case, no, you thought I was an optimist. Uh, so what happens to norms as agents? Um, no, this multi-agent system we need to design, uh, I'm going to describe that as being constituted by rules and norms. We can have a, a Q&A on this. Um, so the question becomes, as you can tell now, stepping back, how can we design the right norms as agents that constitute the right agents, multi-agent systems, that are required to deal with the global problems that are being uh, so, uh, affecting uh, information societies today? New environment, big problems, Big agents to solve these problems, how do we design these big agents, essentially? Well, norms, stepping back again, are some kind of teleological things, that they are for something. Yeah. There's plenty of uh, stuff that can be said about norms, and this is not the right uh, time, uh, it will be another talk. Um, but they have you know, a structure, they are designed according to requirements. Uh, these are specified on the basis of available resources and desired functions. But all this in view of an ultimate purpose. New time in history, big problems, big agents to solve these problems. How do you design the agents? Treat them as bundles of norms. How do you design the norms? Lots of stuff. Bottom line, norms are for something. What's the purpose of those norms that will deliver the agents, will deal the problems, da da. I hope this game is getting kind of uh, simple. Well, norms have lots of functions. At least three are classic. They resolve conflicts, they improve coexistence, they help coordination, collaboration, and fair competition. That's what norms are you know, in a society. You can think about this a bit longer. Uh, maybe I'll make the slides available. Uh, but basically, that's what we normally take in you know, textbook material. But what's the purpose? I mean, all this what for? What's the ultimate end? And here is where finally we start ending you know, this long uh, chit chat on. Uh, and historically, there have been four uh, ultimate purposes of a system of norms as an agent peaceful society, tolerant society, a just, as in justice, uh, society, and a free society. So basically, these four elements have been the the designing principles that have informed <coughs> the shaping of norms, they have constituted agents, they have been dealing with problems in particular society for you know, the achievement of this you know, kind of coexistence. So the question then becomes, now is this always philosophically stepping back? By the way, the, the bigger the gap, the further back you run. So don't be surprised <laughs> that if you don't get close to the problem, the bigger the problem, the further back you have to you know, uh, move in order to jump forward. So one step back. What about these four uh, elements that are behind the design of norms? Justice and tolerance above all. Suppose we simplify, and I've been simplifying already quite a lot, and we use T, P, and L, and J for those four key elements. John Locke, the World War Zero has just ended, roughly is in living memory, we don't want to go there anymore. No more religious wars in, in, in Europe. And how do you get peace? Toleration. <laughs> and that's John Locke on toleration. He says, oh, the only way to get peace is if you can put up with me and I can put up with you. I know my, my country, my rules, your country, your rules, basically. So that's, well, the very, that's, I hope nobody is a scholar of John Locke. But that's a way of simplifying Locke on, on toleration. Toleration delivers peace. So if you want to have a peaceful society, you need to deliver a tolerant society. That's great. Jump forward uh, about 150 years or so. Uh, Mill, Stuart Mill, 
on liberty. So, good news. At the supermarket of ideas, uh, if you uh, uh, get toleration, guess what? You also bring home liberty. So, toleration now buys you two for the price of one. If you have a tolerant society, you can get a peaceful society and a liberal society. Well, that's, that's good news. Somewhere in, in between, someone had already reached that conclusion on the other side of uh, the channel. Had already uh, realized that uh, toleration can deliver liberty and uh, uh, peace, and had already stepped back in terms of well, what delivers toleration. If toleration, as it were, delivers these two other goods, how do I get toleration in place? And according to Kant, uh, universal peace and so on, justice. Justice delivers toleration, which delivers liberty and, uh, and peace. Bingo. You've got the four elements to design your norms, and from Kant onwards, all Western politics, as you know, theoretically speaking, has been based on one single big stone called justice. You have to just move a little bit forward and read uh, uh, on justice. Uh, John Rawls, who is of course a Kantian, and he has exactly the same reasoning is uh, reverse. He says, no toleration, no justice, but for those of you who have done any elementary logic, uh, you just have to uh, uh, add uh, the consequences and uh, it's the same result. Uh, either uh, P then Q or not Q then not P. In this case, no tolerance, no justice. It's a bit more cautious than, uh, than Kant. Uh, but the idea is the same. Uh, make sure that your society is a just <coughs> society and the rest will domino effect to, 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 to follow. How do we deliver justice? Well, now we have lots of questions which I will not address. This is part of the book that I'm writing. Uh, the question I want to address here is what the relationship, the real relationship between uh, uh, toleration and justice. If it is true that this special magic couple can deliver a peaceful and a liberal society, just think about you know, Paris uh, recently. What kind of uh, society do we want to have? A one which is incredibly just but not tolerant? Or incredibly tolerant but not just? Or is a combination of the two so that the rest follows? And the, one I want to, the question I want to address in uh, the second half of the talk is what is the relation between uh, uh, toleration and justice and what can be done in order to, to deliver justice. For those of you who have uh, read Rawls, this passage should ring a big bell. It's the beginning of the text. I'd like you to just have a, a little bit of a moment. Now spend two seconds reading it. Um, I won't read it for you aloud, uh, there's a trick that I'm going to play uh, in, a, in a couple of seconds. I'll give you another moment or two. It all seems to be fairly okay. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But if you have read Rawls recently, as in yesterday, there's something odd here, which I highlighted in red. I'll give you another moment. And what is odd is that actually that's not the real text. The real text is slightly different. It doesn't speak about tolerance. It speaks about justice. This is the real text. Where every tolerance, toleration, is actually justice, just. But if you look at the text, it's perfectly compatible. What Rawls says about justice, he could be saying it about toleration. So there's something odd going on. And if you read uh, uh, his uh, A Theory of Justice, you realize that the two concepts are so close that are almost interchangeable. To the extent that you actually have a passage where you can replace every word with the other word and it still makes perfect sense. So justice and, and toleration have been on equal footing for a long time. It's just that the Westphalian project, which was toleration first, anything else follows, was replaced by the Enlightenment project, Kant and so on, which said, no, 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 justice first and anything else will follow. Now both have their own problems and limits, Justice can be intolerant, as we know, for example, in France. Uh, a, a very uh, liberal and democratic country is intolerant towards what you can wear in a classroom, something that we will find quite surprising here. You cannot wear uh, sort of religious garments and uh, related and so on. I mean, because it's a secular society where secularism is almost a religion. 
sorry for the French guys. Uh, but an overly uh, tolerant society, as we all know since John Locke onwards, uh, it can be also in danger because then it becomes tolerant towards the intolerant. And as he was already warning, don't be tolerant towards the Catholics because they are intolerant and they will take over. And of course that generates a little bit of a problem here because of course, no, no speaking from Rome, uh, well, so how tolerant do you want to be? And that's known as the paradox of tolerance. So both uh, have their own problems. What I want to do is to uh, suggest, following rules, that suppose for a moment that justice is, I don't agree on this, and there's another chapter, it's another talk, I don't agree that justice delivers toleration. I believe actually that there's a way of showing in another context, in another paper, that you can do the opposite. You can have a tolerant society that can solve the paradox and deliver justice. But suppose for a moment, the hard case, the case in which justice delivers uh, toleration, toleration delivers the other goods. What delivers justice? Well, according to uh, the most so accepted uh, at the moment uh, theory, well, in order to have justice, you have to have some ignorance. For those of you who haven't check rules recently, the veil of ignorance. Principles of justice for the basic structure of society are to be chosen by representative parties deprived of information about the talents and socioeconomic status of the parties they represent. Quotation. No one knows his place in society, his class position or social status, nor does he know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence and strength, and the like. Veil of ignorance. Uh, that, that's a misname. That's not ignorance, as I show you in a moment. That is uncertainty. Finally, the last element in the story comes in. And that's where uncertainty starts playing a role. And the value of uncertainty starts making sense, as in the title of this lecture. The value of ignorance is misnamed. Uh, we should be talking about uncertainty. Here is the problem. Tolerance can be defined in the following way, and it's kind of textbook uh, uh, level. So if, not that you cannot disagree, but if you disagree with me, you just don't, don't disagree only with me, but you disagree with the no, orthodox, as you have views. In order to have tolerance, you have to have someone being informed about someone else's action. If you're not informed, you're not tolerant, you just don't know. You have to disapprove, otherwise, well, there's no tolerance, you just don't, yeah, go you must be able to stop that person from doing whatever you disapprove of. Otherwise, that's not tolerance, you're just putting up with. Uh, and you don't stop. So you don't like, you know that someone is doing something, you don't like it, you can stop it, and you refrain from you know, stopping that person. So there's information there that plays a role. The more information you have about someone else, the more tolerance becomes difficult. Inevitably, no. In the same sense in which you know, that's a condition without which tolerance is no exercise. If you had no clue whatsoever about anything else, well, there will be no need for tolerance. So that's the first point. But together with the other point, remember, justice is implemented by a state of ignorance or uncertainty, therefore lack of information. Well, there's a strange uh, point here, which uh, we call it you know, a bit of a political paradox of information. Justice is action without information, rules, no, veil of ignorance. You get better at deciding how many slices go to whom if you have no idea which slice of the cake you're going to get. Because if you have no idea, no information, you're going to go 50-50. Tolerance, well, you're much better at being tolerant, as well, if you don't have to be tolerant, you just don't have any clue. So if you have no clue, well. So in one case, action without information. The other case is information without action. Remember, now I know but I don't stop you from doing something. So somehow, and I know this is hard to digest, but I'll show you a bit of facts in a moment, increasing information does not necessarily increase and is likely to decrease justice and intolerance. I'll play the trick again, just in case, you know, which hat and so on. So justice, <laughs> I can see some of your faces like, mm, <laughs> this is not working. Justice and tolerance are, we, for a moment, we, de we decided to simplify that tolerance is delivered by justice. I said, hey, I'm the first one to disagree, but suppose. Well, then we ask, who, what do you think is going to deliver justice? Well, John Rawls, no, famous theory. I mean, this is the, the mainstream. Also, oh, the veil of ignorance, everybody's serious about. Well, <coughs> let's take that seriously, veil of ignorance. You don't have the information. You have uncertainty about which way to go, and therefore you go 50-50, fantastic. 
So if you increase information, in other words, if you decrease the opacity of that veil of ignorance, well, you decrease the chances of getting a just system, which means you decrease the chances of getting tolerance, which means no, da, 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 the dominant effect goes forward. So we took a lot of steps to go all the way up, but once you, you know, screw up at the beginning, brrr, everything happens again. So here is what we have uh, that uncertainty delivers justice, justice delivers toleration, toleration delivers liberty and, and uh, uh, peace, in an over super simplified way of talking. But what is exactly this uncertainty we're talking about? If it is so crucial to have some uncertainty there, and let, let me remind you that these days we have realized, I hope I'm not stretching the point too much, stop for a moment, think of out of the box, inflation. Well, economists, they finally realize that a bit of inflation is a good thing. Not much, something around uh, 1.8, 2.2 or so, but that helps the system to make sure that investments, that there is not too much saving, money goes back into the system. So a, a pinch of inflation, you want to have it. Look, Europe, deflation problem, medical science. Cholesterol, I, when, I, when I grew up, I said, cholesterol is an enemy. No cholesterol, well. zero cholesterol. Well, cholesterol is there for a reason. A, a tiny little bit of cholesterol is a good thing. And in fact, with this good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and even the bad cholesterol is there for a reason. Not much, but keep it under control. So, so now epistemology and political sense says uncertainty. I grew up thinking uncertainty, zero on, like zero tolerance, always, but not so. A pinch of uncertainty helps the system to work better, as John Rawls uh, has just uh, argued in the Veil of Ignorance. So where does this pinch of uncertainty come from? What is it that I'm talking about? How can it be delivered? And if it cannot be delivered, what solutions do we have? So finally, uncertainty. What is uncertainty? Suppose we talk about only one kind, there are three, I won't tell you about the other two, but only one kind of information. The queen of concepts of information, semantic information, as in I had coffee this morning for breakfast, or the train leaves at time from platform X. The sort of semantic information about the world, also known as factual information. You can take that, as in Paris is the capital of France, and reduce every kind of semantic information to question plus answer. Is Paris the capital of France? Plus, yes. Has the same semantic information as in Paris is the capital of France. That's a typical logical trick. Useful? Yes, because then the I, green, becomes decoupled into a question which has all the content, semantic content, and you can reduce the click that unleashes or unlocks that content to a zero or one, the A in question. Having said that, we know that Alice is informed if she has information. Thank you. Which means she's informed if she has the question and the right answer. The right answer being the relevant and correct answer to that question. Fine. She is uncertain, therefore, if she has only the question, but not the answer. If she has the question, was Berlin the capital of Germany in 1978? Let me check. Uh, or, or what Germany? So she doesn't have the answer. And she ignorant, technically speaking, if she doesn't even have the question. She hasn't even thought that X might be the case, perhaps, perhaps not. So let me illustrate this uh, simply. And this will ring a bell with some American politicians. Um, there are things that she knows, <laughs> and unknown unknowns, uh, things that she knows, uh, for example, she's in a forest and there's a monster hiding, and she's afraid of that. So that's, that's what she's informed about, that's her information. There are things that she knows that she does not know. Where is the monster hiding? I know that I don't know where the monster hiding, that's why I'm afraid. I know it's there, but I don't know where it's hiding, and that's my incipience to be a little bit refined in uh, philosophical terms. Then there are things that she is not quite sure she knows. Does my weapon really going to kill the monster or not? Is it powerful enough? Yes, no, maybe. We can put all that all together. I'm going to treat that as um, uncertainty to simplify. And there are things that she does not even know that she does not know. 
For example, she does not even know, she doesn't even have a question about whether there's a magic sword somewhere that can kill the most. That is beyond her black box. It's, that ignorance is going to play a crucial role soon. How much time do we have? Oh, Bad. 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Okay. So the rest should be much easier, so bear with me. So here's the map. The available information, and in the right to be forgotten, this has played a huge role, available versus accessible, just in case. The available information is all the green stuff, no, the, the information, the Q and the NEA. That can be divided into what Alice has as information. She has access to the questions and the answers. Remember, the Q and the A. And it's only part of all the available information. Then there's her uncertainty, which is she has access to the question, but not to the answers. Does this weapon you know, kill the monster or not? And this is what all the available information to have out of the uh, stuff that we have discussed before. But then there's also the stuff that she doesn't even have access to, not even in terms of questions. It's things that she had never thought about. Now, all that means that all the available information minus her ignorance minus her information is equal to her uncertainty. We play the game, it's quite elementary. Uh, it would be offending if I were to insist on this. So her uncertainty is information available minus information accessible. Remember, we want to increase uncertainty because uncertainty generates justice, which generates... The, but we want to increase it up to a certain point, not too much. It's like cholesterol, it's like inflation. So suppose we keep uh, the available information stable and her ignorance stable. The things that are known and the things that she hasn't even got a clue in terms of questions. How do we no, make sure that her uncertainty grows? If, in this particular case, no, the green arrow says her information is growing, you can no, do the elementary maths, therefore her uncertainty is decreasing. This is the scenario in which we are at the moment. If her uncertainty decreases, the justice decreases, the, the whole thing gets squeezed up to zero cholesterol, zero inflation. So we want to make sure that something gets prompted, that some uncertainty is kept and is kept healthily there. So the policy is a global decrease in uncertainty, a global decrease in questions left unanswered, leads to a global decrease in tolerance. Put simply, more information, sometimes more intolerance. Here is some facts, just in case, and there's a lot of philosophy. But when I check, for example, about religious uh, uh, tolerance, things haven't gone better in the information society. It is not true that the more we know each other, the more we exchange, the more we communicate, the more this is just a global village, the more we are tolerant with each other. Not at all. In fact, the less we can stand each other. Um, once you read this, here is a, a bit of graphics um, to present. Uh, I think it's too small. So uh, this is uh, social hostilities growing. And this is government restrictions going about religious um, toleration. This was the past. Uh, and uh, the bigger, the further you move up here, the more social hostilities and government restrictions are taking place. 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. It's not going better. Uh, there's a tendency to uh, have more social restrictions, more government restrictions. I'm not saying that this is because we have more information, but at least anyone who would argue the opposite, well, in information society, you know, this is going to get better and better, well, th the evidence is not there. As usual, no, negative evidence doesn't prove that something is the case, but it disproves that something is not the case. So we want to have this particular scenario in which some uncertainty gets up while you know, the available information grows because you know, we better put up with that. No, there will be more Wikipedia entries and Alice ignorance and Alice information therefore need to be go, going down. There's, there's no way out of this particular elementary stupid model. If you want to have this growing and this is stable, one of these two have to go down. One could say, well, how about Alice information? Let's, let's decrease her information. Let's make sure that we stop people being informed. Don't tell them. Well, that was, for example, the don't ask, don't tell solution by the American army. 
how do I decrease the overall information within the system? That's it. I don't want to have my question answered. Don't, don't tell me. Which means that Alice, as in the American Army's information, is decreasing. And therefore, the uncertainty is kept buoyant. No, as in no, the cholesterol, the inflation stuff. There's enough uncertainty within the system to improve justice toleration, etc. The problem here is that this comes at a cost, and the cost is paid here with liberties. A, uh, a context, I hope I'm not stretching too much the point, uh, remember that the army, etc., they don't, ask, don't tell, it's not a, it's a suboptimal, let's say, solution, because it does affect the liberties of the individual involved. In other words, there's some restraint in terms of, well, don't ask, don't tell, and don't show either. I mean, you just, you know, if, if, uh, there is a point where I cannot pretend that I don't know. At that point, this is not going to work. So, although these two solutions together are fine, this particular one is going to cost at a liberty uh, price, which we may not be ready to accept. After all, we're doing all this little thing, you know, to get all these goods, and if the cost of getting uncertainty is because you are restricting the liberties of the soldiers who cannot show that they are gay, well, <laughs> sorry, the first point has been uh, uh, undermined. So we're really left with one option. You have to decrease Alice's ignorance. What was that ignorance? The ignorance was, remember, the questions that nobody had ever asked in the first place. No idea. You are in the box. And you're so much in the box that you can't even think that there's something like a box. That's uh, by itself, it looks like an impossible solution. How do I think the unthinkable if it is unthinkable? Uh, by definition, I can't think the unthinkable. Yes, you cannot, but someone else can. And normally, what is unthinkable for Alice is not exactly the unthinkable for Bob. The joint uh, set of ignorance are hardly ever overlapping. That's why it's, it's a bad idea to have a society with individuals exactly well informed at the same level, and it's good to have immigrations, for example, where the level of ignorance mixes up with other levels of ignorance. With a little of illustration, here is Bob and Alice. They have some degree of ignorance. One doesn't even ask questions about the magic sword because she has no clue. That's beyond her box. The other one doesn't even ask questions about, say, the um, uh, special stone because that's beyond his box. But when they come together, well, they can actually share their levels of ignorance. And, uh, for example, they can discover, well, I know that there's a sword. I don't know where it is. So ignorance becomes uncertainty. What was before a question that wasn't even asked in the first place, because you didn't even think about it. I had that question. And the point that you didn't think about, I had that as uncertainty. So my uncertainty erases your uh, ignorance, and your uncertainty erases my ignorance. I hope you are with me on this little trick. So, it's good to be uncertain, it's bad to be ignorant, and if you exchange views, that can help. What about the politics? And then I'm coming to the end of the talk. So I'm looking at Gianluca. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, the politics of uncertainty then. This is the picture we, I mean, basically, I could have just, but that's what I've said in, for 45 minutes. Uh, that's that's the, the, the simple thing. You have that list of things, the dominant effect. We have uh, the view from Locke, Kant, Mill, that a society well designed is a society that delivers peace, liberty, toleration. And we accepted for the moment, for this particular context, on record, this is not what I'm going to argue in the book, uh, that justice delivers toleration, which delivers all these other goods. We also ask what delivers justice? Well, a pinch of uncertainty, John Rawls-like, veil of ignorance, for example. But then we ask what, what delivers uncertainty? The erasing of ignorance. That's what delivers more uncertainty of the right kind. The uncertainty which leaves questions open or questions are answered in a tentative way, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. Um, so I may not have the answer or I may have more than one answer. So justice and tolerance can be fostered by increasing uncertainty which can be increased by decreasing ignorance. <coughs> Back to the original picture. So history, and now you know what I'm talking about, history as in 
the stage between prehistory and hyperhistory, used to be the stage of certainty and information as values, total values. No questions asked, never give me anything else but certainty and information. And as from Descartes onwards, it's been the mantra, at least in any philosophy department. If you can't get certainty, well, that's not good enough. But I would argue that hyperhistory is the stage where we grow up a little bit and nobody should believe for a moment that I'm saying, oh, fantastic, all uncertainty, let's be uncertain. I have no clue about when my flight is tonight. No, no, that's not what I'm arguing. But I'm saying that pinch of cholesterol in your blood, that pinch of uh, inflation in your economy, that pinch of uncertainty in your society, those are good things. It takes an enormous amount of knowledge to understand that you can decrease a little bit the full blast, the full epistemological blast of certainty and so on. So here, uncertainty and shared ignorance, so that they erases each other no, and generates more uncertainty, are values. And because they are values, there's power to be exercised on those values. And I promise this is the last step back I'm going to take. You know, this you know, if then, if then. So. Well, if, really this, if, if this story makes some sense, and I suspect it does, uh, well, what's, what's the exercise of power today? Because if these are, these are, as it were, the, the nodes of our society, that is where, as it were, the body feels the pain or the pleasure, no, the nerves of our world today, surely someone, somewhere, is working to get hold of those nodes, of those nerves. Has always been that way, has been that way in the past, it will be that way in the future. One way of saying uh, that the future is where the past happens again uh, with a twist. Uh, so I want to know the twist. Because the past is happening again. And the twist is what I introduced uh, at the beginning of this lecture by saying power is changing. It's changing from control of information to control of uncertainty. So today, the politics of uncertainty are, we just begun to see, in my view, I hope I'm right, uh, of course, uh, this shift in socio-political power controlling not things, it, I don't care whether it has been produced in China because it has been designed in California anyway, and not the information about where it has been designed, but the questions that deliver the answers, which shape, etc. So Alice's uncertainty is a matter of power. What kind of power is emerging in the 21st century, which would immature information societies? Power, just to remind you, I mean by power the socio-political ability to control or influence people's behavior. Uh, again, just textbook material, just in case. It used to be the creation and control of things goods, services. Then it became information about things, laws, news, and of course it's always been there. I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm presenting this chronologically, but of course these are all you know, parallel lines of development. But in liberal societies which are awash with cheap goods and free information, and here there's a whole policy of commodifi commodification which is beautiful, if you commodify things, then you better be the one who actually controls what controls the non-commodified item. So if you commodify books and become cheap, and in fact free, anyone can get them, by the billions, you better be the one who actually controls the search engine. Because the books are valueless. I mean, who pays for books these days if I can you know, Google and find them? And, say, and who pays for you know, all this stuff that is 0.90p on Amazon, unless you are Amazon who controls the search engine to find the stuff, and so on. That's a simple elementary uh, way of uh, thinking about commodification as a tool for political power. Well then, how is exercised about which question can be asked and what answers can be received? And all the topics that we've been discussing recently, transparency, privacy, right to be forgotten, freedom of speech, ownership rights, they're all about which questions can be asked and which questions can be answered, if you think of it. So the morphology, and sorry this is uh, the last moment of pain, the morphology of the flows of information is the morphology of the flow of uncertainty. But since we said that power has shifted from power over things to power over information, well then we are actually buying here is that uh, the morphology of power today is the morphology of uncertainty. Now if I had said this you know, uh, 45 minutes ago, it would have sounded really French. Like, uh, the morphology of power is the morphology of uncertainty. Like, yeah, whatever. But I hope you understand why that is the case. What's the logic behind and why this makes uh, sense. Conclusion, um, power in a mature information society is not just about things or information about things, but about uncertainty, questions shaping answers, giving rise to information about things. 
In a mature information society, and that's the last slide, so you can start breathing. Uh, in a mature information society, those who control the questions shape the answers, and those who shape the answers control reality. Welcome to the 21st century. Thank you.